Hi folks, it's time for Sunday School Bonanza, the Gospel Doctrine podcast brought to you by This Week in Mormons. Find us over at thisweekinmormons.com. Visit us on the Facebook and the Twitter and the things and wherever you want to be. And uh, and that's it, you know. And of course, keep an eye out for our other podcasts. And if you don't like this podcast or you do, send us an email contact at thisweekinmormons.com where we will maybe respond to you. That's right. Anywho... Without further ado, let's bring on our host for the week. You know him, you love him. Bishop Kurt Frankham is with us, everybody. That's right. Thank you, President. Uh, and, hey, if, and if you get sick true. of, uh, you know, if you run out of, you listen to all of Twim's podcasts, you can come on over to Leading LDS. We've got a great podcast going on over there. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. You should. Is that, go- is that going well? Have you seen good growth, the numbers? How's life? Absolutely. It's going you don't very have to- well. And I've got yeah. some fascinating guests. I just uh, interviewed a grandson of uh, Harold B. Lee. That was interesting. And uh, and this morning, right before I'm recording this podcast, I uh, interviewed a Relief Society president in Kirtland, Ohio, and learned an enormous amount of stuff from her. So, how do you find how do you find these people? How well, does one find Harold B. Oh, Lee's grandson? They find and, me, Jeff. They find. Is me. that what it is? No. <laughs> they just know. Me. Um, I, it, he writes a, a blog that I read, and then um, I've been interviewing a lot of Elders Quorum presidents and uh, other bishops, and I just said, kind of threw out there, hey, I need to interview some Relief Society presidents, and uh, sh- she responded. So Cool. Yeah, good stuff. Well, good for you. Yeah, guys, you can find that at leadingLDS.com. I believe you're up on iTunes now, yeah? I am, yes. You got that published, so find it over there. Search for Leading LDS. Listen to Kurt talk about Kurt leadership, and I will listen to him even more now because, as he referenced, I am now president, which is horrible. That's right. But that's life. What can you do? Life goes on. Our lesson this week, since we can get to the actual content, lesson 23, the Lord be between thee and me forever. Uh, you're in First Samuel 18, primarily also chapter 20, chapters 19, 20, 23 through 24. A lot of things to read. I think the, the basic gist of this lesson, the lesson manual says, talks about the importance of true friends. But Kurt and I were saying, we feel this lesson is a lot more about uh, pride and envy and things like that. And the lessons we can learn from Saul and from Ab- Jonathan. At this yeah, time. absolutely. And the nice thing, the benefit we'll have during our discussion, Jeff, is that I actually taught this lesson this past Sunday. And so it is as if I'm getting in my time machine and letting you know how this lesson will go, what the do's and don'ts, really? the things that worked, things that didn't work. And one of those things is the uh, the attention activity that I didn't even use. I I used my own activity. But You mean the attention question? Yes, it's an attention question. Which It's not even an activity this time, guys. It's yeah. just what qualities do you look for in a friend? Right. And I, I, I did start right. out my lesson with asking, you know, if anybody had uh, childhood friends that, you know, have been their friends forever. Do you have childhood friends, Jeff, that you're still in touch with? I do. I do. And it's, you know, I have to talk every week, but you pick up right where you left off regardless of how much time has passed, right? I would say more or less, though obviously you're more prone to reminiscing yes. than, than the daily friendships that you yeah. have. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then there's your good friend Al that you two are this that's a that's a parallel we can draw. So Jonathan and David is like Jeff and Al. <laughs> is it really though? <laughs> where each week they just they you know without a doubt they're just good friends. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh my suggestion for an attention activity, bring a javelin with you if you have one. <laughs> And just say, what is this? How would you feel if I chased you around with it and tried to kill you? Today, we're going to talk about a man that did that. That's my attention activity. Yeah, Saul loses it in this chapter. Let's just say that. He, the crazy switch flips. And uh, mainly because it starts out talking about um, where this envy comes from that Saul has towards David. Um, and let me see. So I, and I asked this question in... Uh, okay in the lesson of of if you've ever, ever been envious towards somebody and so forth. And in First in Samuel 18, kind of gives this context of why Saul felt this way. It says, And Saul was very wroth 
And the saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousand, and unto me they have ascribed oh, yes. but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And so I asked the question, like, uh, where, where do we see a lot of envy and, and jealousy? And somebody raised their hand and said, Facebook! And I thought, you know what? This is true, because <laughs> okay. David had 10,000 likes, and Saul only had thousands of likes. And this caused great concern, I think. And this is w- one reason I'm, I'm jealous of uh, This Week in Mormons, because you have many more likes than, than I do on Facebook. Oh, goody. But by that token, you could argue that, uh, you know, Elder Neil L. L. Anderson should be jealous and envious of Dieter F. Uchtdorf because the disparity they have as well between Facebook likes is huge. And so you you see how they handle it so well. They still love each other. They don't measure their worth by Facebook likes, as did Saul. I I do wonder if this were the McKay era and you had like Harold B. Lee with Hubie Brown. I don't know how they would feel. Mm. in the same situation um, and the it's other true. funny thing is we've this isn't to go after women but i like that it's actually women basically singing these things and sort of chanting them right and you also you also see in that same sense the classic case of jealous men where women as well had this sway over them and he, i would honestly think he got mo- even more upset because it was the women and in a sense of they wanted to Saul wants to be impressive to the women and then he's like wait a minute they're more impressed with david as well for her ten, his ten thousand over my 1,000. Yeah, and that's when the, cr- the crazy switch flips, and he becomes so ob- obsessed yeah. with taking David out. It's, it's perplexing. And uh, he tries different sly methods to just straight up chasing him with a javelin and throwing it at him. And, and luckily that's when David's good friend steps in, who is the son of Saul, uh, Jonathan, who has made mm-hmm. a covenant with a friendship. In chapter 18, he makes covenant of friendship with David. And uh, it's quite impressive, especially, uh, I think you mentioned before uh, we recorded that, you know, Jonathan was the son of Saul, who you would think would be expecting the kingdom, but Solomon promised it to um, to David, and there was no... Not Solomon, Sam, Samuel. Samuel, I was, Samuel. I knew that. So, so Samuel, yes, promised it to, to David, and uh, but there's no malice um, that Jonathan had, and quite... Which is... Which I think is pretty remarkable, and especially if yeah. you remember in the pre- in the uh, the preceding lesson, you know, when you read First Samuel fifteen, that's when Saul messes up a bunch, ref- doesn't fulfill the will of the Lord. When Samuel says, you know, to obey is better than to sacrifice, and at the end it says, in the sp- and like the Lord was with Saul no more. And it's interesting when you see how much that clearly actually affects Saul by not having the Lord on his side, literally. And guiding him in any way. And so instead, Saul just goes off the deep end. And it's remarkable that his son, Jonathan, was unaffected in that sense. You could be very jealous if you were in Jonathan's shoes. Because this is this is like being friends with the most popular guy. And you're just kind of the devoted... This is like this is like a, a Ron Weasley, Harry Potter situation. <laughs> know what I'm saying? Uh, it, there's We can draw lots of parallels here. But there's always the sidekick who gets less love, but he's always loyal. This is Samwise yeah. Gamgee. And Frodo, you know, <laughs> oh, boom! Boy. The nerd, my uh, my nerd alert is going off. It's it's, <laughs> <laughs> um, but absolutely. And, but um, and you. But can I read? Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go no, no. Ahead. After you. Well, I want to read a quote from President Benson. It talks about the pride that Saul experienced. Great talk. Okay. So, so President Benson says Saul became an enemy to David through pride. He was jealous because the crowds of Israelite women were singing that Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. The proud stand more in fear of men's judgment than of God's judgment. What will men think of me weighs heavier than what will God think of me. Fear of men's judgment manifests itself in competition for men's approval. The proud love the proud love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Our motives for the things we do are where the sin is manifest. Jesus, he did always those things that pleased God. Would we not do well to have the pleasing of God as our motive rather than to try to elevate ourselves above our brother and outdo another? Uh, some prideful people are not so concerned as to whether their wages meet their needs as, as they are that their wages are more than someone else's. Their reward is just being a cut above the rest. When pride has a hold on our hearts, we lose our independence of the world and deliver our freedoms to the bondage of men's judgment. 
The world shouts louder than the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. The reasoning of men overrides the revelations of God and the proud let go of the iron rod. Long quote. That's from his famous pride talk, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and you know, I listened to that talk. I think it was that talk as in preparation for this. I know it was a talk about pride from President Benson, so I figure that would be it. But um, I listened to the audio, and it was actually read by President Hinckley. Um, I never realized that, hmm. that, uh, that, you know, that instead of President Benson giving the talk, President Hinckley stood and read it for him, because obviously um, President Benson was uh, was ailing in health. But a little factoid there for you. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't know that either. I think it's fascinating, though. How easy is it for us to uh, put the the approbation of the world ahead of that of God? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's exceptionally easy because we're humans. And as much as we strive to have a relationship with God, I find, you know, it's... Uh, I, how do I say this? It's, it's, we always want to aspire to having that closeness and developing our spirituality and our relationship with the Lord. But I think when we have something temporal right in front of us that we physically interact with daily, it, be- it becomes easier to, by default, lend more credence to that or, or give more weight to those things if we're not careful with ourselves so that we're not making God a priority when we care far more about whatever it may be. But they said work, perceptions, being the, pe- the person people notice, all those things, as opposed to just worrying about what God wants us to do. Yeah, I mean, society has a different uh, ruler or, or measuring stick uh, when it comes to this stuff. And so it's easy to get it caught up in, again, going back to the my bad example with Facebook likes. Uh, but there's, you know, it's easy to fall back on these uh, secular uh, rating systems that tell us or define us as individuals when really our humility and faithfulness and obedience to God is, is really right. where the focus should be. Um, but it all starts... Uh, in the lesson, it talks about oh, where was it the uh, the spirit, the evil spirit that came upon Saul, and it mm-hmm. you know everybody from time to time will experience a feeling of envy, but it's what we do with that feeling um, that that really makes a difference. And this is you know in this in these verses, it's an example of what not to do with such a feeling, and and it <clears throat> becomes a monster and gets out of control, and now Saul's. It was once a, a great man is now chasing David with a with a spear, a javelin, javelin, yeah. And it gets so bad that Saul. I mean, David eventually basically leaves the area, mm-hmm. so to speak. And of course, Jonathan says that he will always be faithful to David. That he will, you know, as much as saying, "I will keep your secrets. I will make sure that uh, nothing will happen to you. I will maintain uh, the fealty, the fealty, fealty of the, this friendship. We'll make it together." And I think it's a great example. Jonathan, I mean, how would you feel if your own dad is the one who's still the king and he's going after your buddy? That'd be a lot of pressure to buckle and to cave and to deliver up your friend because it's your own father. Yeah. And, and and especially in these very patriarchal systems of the Old Testament, yeah. you want to do good in the eyes of your father. Yeah. And yet Jonathan is effectively uh, rebelling against his father's own wishes. Yeah, and there's many times where Saul sits Jonathan down and says, "Hey, I need your help. You know, you've got David's trust, and not so many words, but you know." And Saul's pressuring Jonathan to help him, but um, Jonathan's faithful to his friendship. And uh, and I always, especially in the Old Testament, I've said this in in uh, past Sunday school bonanzas I've done, but uh, there's always such a strong parallel to Jesus Christ in in these stories. And Jonathan being right. um, that person as the adversary chases us with a spear, um, this, the Savior's there to step in and protect us and, and show, you know, and, and I like the, the, uh, the concept of it being a friend and how the Savior is our friend and he's covenanted with us through, you know, you could say through friendship um, because he cares and loves about us so deeply. So good, good parallel, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, so as we go to the back end of the lesson here, near the end, um, you see that uh, Saul eventually brings his armies, basically, upon David. David is in uh, Kela, and he's going to bring his own armies to destroy the city because he's got to kill David. Got to kill David because if David's supposed to be king and you kill David, David can't be king anymore. Then you stay king is my logic behind that. Um, but then during an attempt to find and kill David, Saul stops and rests in a cave. And, of course, David's men, see, they find him and they say, 
basically like, well, you know, this is our chance to take care of this guy. But all David does is he gets up and he cuts off the skirt of Saul's robe. And what this means is the hem of Saul's robe, which was a portion, a portion of his robe that symbolized his authority in a way. And maybe I don't fully understand this, the next scripture in verse 5 of chapter 24, because it says that David's heart smote him because he had cut off uh, Saul's skirt. Does that mean that uh, even David feels bad for having just done that? even though it didn't physically harm Saul? Is that what it's trying to say? Uh, I would guess that maybe it's more of, uh, you know, the, the heartbreak David feels to see such a good man fall. Okay. Um, I don't know. That's uh, that's maybe how I perceive it, because I think David does have, sense. you know, he's a righteous man and um, does have a Christ-like love towards this, this king that he respected. Yeah, and I like that because of that David refuses to harm Saul, which yeah. is another great example, because he's not saying... He's been threatened so many times, but he's like, the Lord is on my side. I'm not going to be a murderer. That's not that's not what it's all about. That's not what I'm here to do. So yeah. whatever, Saul, you're an idiot, but I'm going to let you keep being an idiot. And then it's amazing that Saul, of course, says, you know, thou art more righteous than I. For thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded the evil. Which is interesting. Uh, and he goes on about that. And it's funny because I don't think this still brings about a complete change in Saul. It's not like they become chums after this, I don't believe. But uh, but Saul is, is given clemency in a way, mm-hmm. and it moves him. So so there we go. Cool. Guys, don't be prideful. Prideful can Pride can bury you. That's right. And this, this is a great lesson. I got a lot of good discussion going. Um, so... If, if that's any encouragement, a lot of people have a lot to say about uh, envy and, and so forth. And all, go for the Elder Holland video that's in the lesson plan. You can't go wrong with throwing a little Elder Holland voice in your lesson. And it's a great uh, <laughs> minute and a half or so about envy that, in a general conference talk he gave a few years ago. So Cool. All right. Well, let's do that. Everyone, we also encourage you once again, please visit Kurt over at Leading LDS and just blogs, podcasts, all those things, all about leadership in the church. It's a nice little thing he's got going on there. And uh, go see us at thisweekinmormons.com. Download this show. Share it with people. Yada, yada, yada. This is Lesson 23. The Lord be between thee and me forever from the Old Testament manual. Kurt, thanks for taking the time to be with us. It's always a pleasure, Jeff. Pleasure's ours. But thanks for tuning in to Sunday School Bonanza, everybody. We appreciate you uh, making us making us what we are. We like, we'll like. we keep doing it for you. And we hope you have a good Sunday. Oh, there you eating something now? You got some, some flakes. You okay there, Kurt? Everything okay? I'm good. Grabbing what? bags, it seems. Did I? What so did I loud. do? Oh, it was loud? So loud. Sorry. Oh, my goodness. Sorry. I'm sorry, everyone. We were doing so well. Okay. <laughs> well, Kurt, you're the best. Everyone, thanks for listening in. This is Sunday School Bonanza by This Week in Mormons. Hope